aperture. I'm going to first introduce Keith Calhoun and Chandra before me. Um, they're both born and raised in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans in Louisiana. They are a husband and wife team and they've been documented in Louisiana for more than 25 years. Their body of work called Slavery, the Prison Industrial Complex, began in the early 1980s and continues today. Uh, it includes a historical record and testimony of life at Angola and also uh, the documenting um, various aspects of the forced labor that goes on in Angola and the surrounding um, communities. Um, they write that this work sheds light on the criminal justice system of forced labor and the guns of white men on horseback in Louisiana's Angola State Prison. Um, Calhoun and McCormick have do documented the soul of New Orleans, as they call it, and a vanishing Louisiana, as they describe it, the last year cane field, the dock workers, the sweet potato harvesters, and the displacement of African Americans after Katrina. Please join me in welcoming uh, Sandra and Keith. Good evening. Thank you all for coming out. Our work started at Angola, as Makeda mentioned, in the, in the early 80s. Um, this image is, is called Work Call, and it's actually an image of the men as they come out from the dormitory um, to go to work in the morning. And speaking to people who have, who have been incarcerated, um, this, this image, I'm really happy that I took it. It struck me anyway because of all of the bondage but, um, and, and the confinement. But it, it's, it's, um, it's a very important point for prisoners. Um, this is work call and when uh, they have a certain amount of time to get out in the morning. To, to get to this point so that they can go to work. And it's really critical because if they're late um, by a minute or, or anything, you, you get there too late to hear your name or your number called, then you automatically go to the dungeon or the hole or lockdown. So th this, it's, a, it's very important for them to get to this point um, and be able to make it to work on time because the consequences of this can be shattering for many things that you do. And by that, it's um, if, you, if you're late, when you go to the hole, if there are um, things that you were involved in in the prison, um, to woodworking or um, whatever, whatever it is, uh, classes, anything that you're trying to learn and, and do, to go forward, well then you miss out on those things when you get sent to the hole. So that's why this image is critical um, for those men who have to go to work every morning. And, and the, the reasons that they could be late is because the dormitories have like 200 men and they only have five baths. So someone is going to miss out and, and that's what can happen. Um, this is this is a young man who was a part of the rodeo, and um, he he was really he looked really sad to me. Um, we talked a little, but I couldn't talk that much to him, so I just I wanted to take his portrait. He looks like he's the same age as my son, and this is um, line boss. The line boss um, he. He's the person who maintains the line, but there are inmates who carry out his orders. So what these guys are doing, they're, they're going in the row, but they all have holes. And so they're chopping and cutting, cutting the grass. Right here, they're walking to where they have to be, but they cut the grass. And um, through people that I've spoken with, some of those guys train the horses to know when, when spots are missed. So they can go the whole day, and if they miss a spot, then at the end of the day they're gonna find out, or they'll find out at the end of the week, um, and their privileges are taken from them. 
You know, they'll, they'll work the whole week and then they'll say, oh, on Tuesday, you missed this cut or that cut. And they have horses that actually kick up to see if there's grass and not dirt. So those are some things that happen with this. And these are some of those same guys with a um, man on horseback with, with the gun. This is another portrait of um, a young man whose name is Freddie King, and he was one of the guys in the rodeo. Um, and he, he was like a horse rider. He didn't do any bullfighting or anything, but he was a horse rider. They had all kinds of little tricks that, that they do. This is called 23 hour lockdown, uh, CCR lockdown, you know. If you ever heard of Albert Woodfall, that's what these guys spent like 40 something years living in the cell block. Again, the point that Sean and Shula were called, but this is the consequence. If you don't make it to that gate, you're going to go straight to the dungeon here. And, um, and life can be pretty much hard for you once you get in the dungeon because Angola have certain people that stays in the cell block to prey on the young inmates. So it's a lot of things can happen to you if you fall into this trap here because you might not never come out, you know, so. Uh, and this is the man in the field working. Um, again, it's mandatory that you work in Angola, else you're gonna continue to live in that cell block, so. Um, if you see it's early in the morning, and I think they're gonna work, go in at 11 and then go back to 3 o'clock. And again, this is two men in the cell block. And again, it's very dangerous living in this block because you don't know what you're in the cell block with. So if you see how close these two men have to live with each other, it can be very difficult at times. You know, because you don't know what you're sleeping with. You know, as soon as you go to sleep, sleep somebody might just stab you up or anything can happen, you know. Again, that's the men in the work field and it, it's, it's amazing when we was, you know, like through our time period, I took this picture in 1980. And as we go back to Angola, ain't much have changed since that time, you know. You still have the men getting up in the morning. And you gotta get this mandatory that you go to work or else you're gonna, you're gonna feel it. And then when you go out here, the line boss might have a guy, if you don't wanna work, you have to tell his, his headband guy that you want to work, so we, you got to bring a card of cigarettes or something. You're going to have to pay something to get out of work that day. And this is, um, I call this muted men, because in Angola, there's an old saying that the men on the horse working harder than that mule, and you have more respect for the mule, like you might tell them, that they call them the boss, you might say good morning boss, and the boss speak to the mule, because you, you, you're not nothing to him. So that's the reason why this picture I photographed because I always heard growing up as a young boy about the, the man on the horse. Again, this is a guy I grew up with named Glenn Dimmerell, um, who which, uh, he's home now and he's deacon at his church. But uh, it was interesting to see Glenn in the cell block because I knew his mother and when she told me, she said, I hope you see before I went to Angola, a lot of the people, I knew their parents and stuff, so we was able to talk. And you know, it's interesting for me and Shonda, we live on both sides of the land because when I went to Angola to document, I, it's guys that I played marbles with, guys that I went to school with, you know, so I wasn't fear them. Like sometimes the free man would tell me, boy, y'all don't want to go back there in CCR because they're going to throw feeders or something on you. But we was able to, I would say, well, let me go see what it's like, you know? And it'd be someone from the neighborhood. Again, this is the um, lining up in the morning. Um, you see the guys putting their hands up. And again, like Sean would say, it's mandatory that you get to this line. Even though you got 200 men to take a shower behind, you better get there. I don't know, there's something about the light in this hole. And there's another guy laying in the cell block with him. And I don't think Angola, you know, this is the side of Angola that they don't really want to advertise. 
about what we're seeing in the images and about what we will hear about in Zachary's work and hear about and see in Deborah's images. Um, that Angola, of course, is the largest maximum security prison in the country, um, with its roughly 6,000 inmates and the, lar the largest number of inmates serving life sentences as well. It's roughly the size of Manhattan, I believe. Um, it's a very large um, place. Uh, it has its origins in the 19th century as a slave plantation, uh, which distinguishes uh, the Angola and other prisons in the South from prisons in the North as they had this kind of origins in slavery, and that had a huge impact on the kind of um, work requirements and the kind of culture that these prisons um, instituted as well. Uh, by the 1990s, it was known, notoriously known for its terrible treatment of its prisoners and the violence. Uh, they had a new warden, uh, I believe about 92 or so, um, Bert Kane, who instituted a number of reforms, and I believe he just retired in 2016. And the um, rodeo that Chandra is re referring to is a yearly event where um, inmates kind of perform a, a rodeo, essentially, and they, they sell various items um, that they made uh, during their time there, and it's very popular for people from all over the region to come and to kind of see, see this uh, event. And now I'll introduce Zachary uh, Lazar, uh, the novelist who published his first novel, Aaron, approximately in 1998. In 2009, he published his memoir, Evening's Empire, The Story of My Father's Murder, which was selected as the best book of 2009 by the Chicago Tribune. Um, he recently published his fourth novel, Vengeance, inspired by a passion play he witnessed at Angola, and it also incorporates images from Deborah's uh, Tooth for an Eye, a choreography of violence in New Orleans Parish. The man on, here, on the screen here is Layla Roberts, who's been a friend of mine now for five years. Um, correspond and talk on the phone. He knows that this is happening. He knows that this image is here. And the best way for me to explain why I'm on the stage is actually to read the first part of this novel that just came out you know, yesterday. My friend Deborah, the photographer, once told me that she just trusts color because it's too seductive. It prevents us from seeing what's really there. She wasn't speaking metaphorically. She was just explaining why she prefers to shoot in black and white. But in a larger sense, she was talking about the rigor of looking not glancing, not turning away. That first night we spent at Angola, we went outside to view the main prison under lights, the rectilinear massiveness of it, the fences and razor wire. I wanted to walk toward it across the vast lawn, but Deborah said no, she'd heard there were snakes. So instead we walked down the road and made out two other camps in the distance across empty fields under the moonlight. I knew Angola was huge, but this was the first real sense I'd had of it. It was its own planet. That night, from the empty space around the bachelor's officer's quarters where we, were, where we were to sleep, it was like when you're on an airplane coming into a foreign city in the dark, and you see the different grid patterns of lights and gradually make out the vast shape of what's below. It was as if all the importance in the world had coalesced in those fields. Violence, punishment, collision, consequence, all that significance beyond the limits of my small understanding. We got into Deborah's truck the next morning and followed the assistant warden, Kathy, from the BOQ past the main prison, then across the fields where a work gang was marching slowly in the glare and mist, carrying hoes straight upright against their shoulders, the angled blades a jagged clutter above their bowed heads. The workers were mostly black men in cuff jeans and pale blue shorts or white t-shirts overseen by white men on horseback with guns. There was something pornographic about the scene, as if it had arisen out of someone's half-understood fantasies. The fields beyond spread out lush and green, the endless landscape from last night now exposed in daylight. Angola had once been several adjacent slave plantations in central Louisiana. The original slaves were said to have been brought from Angola. We had come to witness the rehearsal and production of a passion play, The Life of Jesus Christ, performed by Angola's inmates and their female counterparts from the nearby women's penitentiary in St. Gabriel. I write fiction, nonfiction, sometimes a hybrid of both, and I've tried to understand the impulse behind this blending, to understand that there's something I'm not seeing that most other people are, and, I hope, something I'm seeing that they are not. What I seem to resist is the idea that the real and the imaginary don't bleed into each other. Perhaps this is because what really happens in the world so often belies any notion of realism. 
It was an implausible coincidence, for example, that had led Deborah and me to this project in Angola. Both of us had a parent who was murdered. Both murders happened in the same city, Phoenix, Arizona. They were both contract killings. I don't know how you calculate the odds of Deborah and I ever meeting after such an implausible coincidence, but many years later, after establishing our separate lives, we did meet when I moved to New Orleans, where it turned out our houses were two blocks away from each other. You can see my roof from Deborah's roof. A strange coincidence, transformative, unbidden, like a fire. It seemed possible to me that by collaborating on this prison project, we might force this coincidence to become more than just an unlikely wound that we share. As I wrote rather grandiloquently in my letter to the assistant warden asking for permission to visit, I thought that by interpreting this play about the possibility of redemption in the wake of violence, Deborah and I might somehow enact a kind of redemption of our own. That word redemption strikes me as dubious now, a sign not exactly of bad faith, but of something inside myself I don't trust. That first night in the BQE, I'd spread a thin sheet over one of the single beds in the dorm room and tried to read in that place, usually occupied by guards sleeping between their shifts. The mattress was covered in plastic. Even the pillow was covered in thick plastic. I examined my shoes and jeans and socks on the floor in the greenish clinical light, and I felt within myself, I'm, I'm sorry, I felt within the dread of that place an uncomfortable wish to be there, that place where I didn't wish to be. Deborah had been there many times, photographing the inmates. They were ambiguous portraits, often beautiful and ugly at the same time. Of course, shooting photographs in black and white is not an analogy for seeing the world in black and white. On the contrary, the entire interest of black and white photography is in the infinite range of grays. We parked outside the arena, the facility where they held the prison rodeo twice each year, and I began to help Deborah with some of her equipment, but I could soon tell that she didn't want my help. Something about stepping outside the truck into the brightness and dust made us fretful, overly alert. It scrambled our signals, and somewhere in here I lost track of what was happening. I saw a camel standing in the dead grass outside the arena's gates, blonde, tall, attended by two men in cowboy clothes who looked at me without humor. Inside the arena, beyond the brown painted gates and fences, men in work boots and jeans were still building the stage sets. So far, three wooden crosses bedecked with ropes had been raised on a mound of dirt. Beyond them, amid a few ranks of potted bushes and a shrubs, and a fake Roman temple made of plywood, a crowd of about 70 inmates was standing around chatting, the men in street clothes, the women from St. Gabriel in jeans and light blue shirts bearing the initials of the Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women in black letters. Kathy, the assistant warden, was responding to a call on her cell phone. Deborah had disappeared beneath the grandstand where she would set up for her photographs, formal portraits of the actors before a black velvet screen. The person who was supposed to be my escort had already lost interest and retreated far into the shade, texting. There were several animals involved in the production. The camel I'd just seen, some horses that now came charging across the arena at full speed. But the donkey, Kathy was learning now, had been quarantined because he had a communicable disease. And so maybe there would be no donkey this week. A woman who spoke with a Scottish accent was asking a prison employee what kinds of fruit they might find with which to bedeck the table for the last supper scene. Were there melons, she asked, looking for something large enough for spectators to see from a distance. But no, there were no melons. Grapes? No, no grapes. Apples and oranges, that was pretty much it. Apples and oranges plus some bread. It was dawning on me as I stood there watching all this that the men working on the still emerging sets with tape measures, levels, hammers, and saws were not hired carpenters but inmates. The man standing next to me in the Texas Longhorns cap with the Nikon camera was an inmate. He was a reporter for the prison magazine, he told me, covering the same story I was covering. A man who happens to be the son of God is betrayed, convicted, and sentenced to death. On the third day, he rises from the grave to save the world with a message not of retribution, but of mercy. I can't read you the whole book, but if you want to find more, you could buy copies back then. Thank you. The best way to go into an unknown territory, wrote Dorothea Lange, is to go in ignorant, as ignorant as possible. 
with your mind wide open, as wide open as possible, not having to meet anyone else's requirements but your own. And that's how I went into the Louisiana prison system in 1998 to work on my project, One Big Cell, Prisoners of Louisiana. I didn't study prison statistics or consult books on criminology, but I did have a few rules to guide the work. Each inmate who participated in the project was a volunteer and posed themselves before the camera. There, were no prison, there was no prison architecture in the images. Each inmate received wallet-sized photos of all images taken, usually 10 to 15 images per person. I returned approximately 25,000 images to inmates during the five years of shooting in the prisons. So I'll just show a few of these. This is Gumby uh, and Christine Levy. Uh, this was a fella in the minimum security prison, and he asked me to photograph him holding the photograph of his son so he could send it to his son so his son would know that he was thinking about him while he was in prison. And this is an example of the way these are produced. They're five by four inches uh, as silver emulsion on prepared aluminum and they're all engraved on the back with just basic information. The prison, uh, the location of the prison, this case, St. Gabriel, Louisiana, uh, Geraldine Washington, uh, her DOC number, her place of birth, New Orleans, um, the sentence is five years, and um, she is dressed for the Halloween haunted house at the prison. Uh, I decided I didn't want these framed on the walls. I wanted people to be able to touch them. So I had this black um, steel cabinet fabricated and the drawers open. It sounds sort of like bars closing. Um, and you reach in and just take out handfuls of these images to see. And it's really quite a different viewing experience. I brought a little um, proof box and if anybody is interested in looking at them afterwards. I'm happy to share those. This is Smurf, and he has a tattoo, which I always like to describe in public. It says, real men eat pussy. <laughs> <laughs> this is our Tally B. Wiley with her bunny. These are two men from um, Camp F at Angola. This is Peter Lim. Um, He's dressed for the rodeo, and uh, Zelfia Adams is dressed for the Mar Mardi Gras parade at the women's prison. <coughs> and this man's name is Hustle Man, and he is, um, as I said, the inmates pose themselves. So this was the pose that he took. The first pose he took was to stand and lower his head. Um, I'll show a few pictures from uh, images from Tooth for an Eye. It's a companion project to One Big Self. Tooth for an Eye, a choreography of mapping of violence in Orleans Parish. It's an archive of places where homicides have been committed in, in New Orleans. This is uh, how I showed them. Uh, all, I showed them on the wall, but I had a, a hickory and sweetgum and steel viewing table built and there are six large ledgers, and inside the ledgers, uh, let's take me back, yes, on one, on one side of the spread will be uh, used a, a rubber stamp and filled in the information about the crime, and then on the other side of the spread is the image. So again, I, I'm encouraging people to touch the work. This is uh, the Olive Meat Market. Uh, January 8th, 2002, 9.25 p.m. Name, Brandon Agason, 17 years old. Notes, drive-by shooting, a stranger used Agason as a human shield. I used an 8x10 camera with a 4 by um, a lens that covers 4 by 5 to create this tondo. And these are the photographs that are being shown here. After taking 25,000 prison portraits and 250 homicide sites, I felt perhaps I'd chosen, I'd choose a lighter subject for my next project. And I jokingly uh, proposed a project on kittens of Ireland. 
but in the 2012, Assistant Warden Kathy Fontenot invited me to return to Angola to make portraits of inmate actors in the production of the play, The Life of Jesus Christ. So this is Earl Davis, and he's John the Baptist. And this is Mr. Blackburn, and he's a writing soldier, Roman soldier. They made their own costumes, and I don't know if you can see the details, but his, the front of his costume is the, the bottom, a vinyl bottom of a, of a kitchen chair. And the cardboard, swords, and football helmets, and very, very inventive. Lavelle Tolliver as Judas. And um, so in 2014, I took my Guggenheim monies and returned to Angola to make a series of 35 millimeter screen tests of several of the Passion Play participants in and out of costume. So the last uh, image was Lavelle Tolliver as Judas, and this is Lavelle Tolliver in his prison clothes. While filming the screen test, I stayed at the prison guest house, which is perched high up in the Tunica Hills portion of the prison, with an overlook of the bottomland fields, oxbow lakes, and inmate camps. In the evenings, the quiet was unearthly. I had read somewhere that the earth rings like a bell about 16 octaves below middle C, and I could feel the hum. And in the twilight, imagine spirits of all those that had perished there rising in the mist. I recalled reading that in 1699, when Iberville first encountered the Homa tribe at this bend in the Mississippi, the men of the tribe sang the explorers in without stopping, all the way from their boats to their settlement. And I remembered Warden Kane commenting that Angola's dirt contained more sorrow than any land in the South. So when I was nominated for the Robert Gardner Fellowship, I proposed a project on the history of the land that is now Angola Prison. The project was to do uh, wet plate landscapes of the prison and then work with the drama club again and the men would make their costumes and pose as historical figures associated with the history of Angola. <coughs> So I got in and I took a handful of landscapes and was promptly asked to leave. Um, so I've been struggling to get back in. And I think I think I may be able to get back in to do the landscapes. Um, warden Benoit, uh, the new warden, uh, I think is a man of his word, and he, he said um, that I would be able to do that portion. So uh, this is a part of the Tunica Hills, an inmate dug out uh, Mastodon uh, tusk here. It's digging dirt and it just fell out on his head or something. It just gives you an idea of how vast and haunted this place is. And then as a workaround, um, I'm working with formerly incarcerated people. This is um, Alton Bridges, his brother Ruby Bridges, who is a little girl, helped integrate the schools in New Orleans and Alton was incarcerated at Angola, and he's posing as Isaac Franklin, who was a plantation owner. He owned all the plantations that are now included in uh, an Angola prison, and uh, he was also the largest domestic slave trader in the United States at the time. He died there, and they shipped his body back to Tennessee in a keg of whiskey. And I think that's what I got for you. Thanks. Um, my first question has to do with the fact that uh, this is a site that largely came into broader consciousness in the United States in the 1930s when the WPA workers were around that region and discovered the, the music of um, Angola inmates and um, began to record it and document it and that kind of uh, awakened the rest of the world to what was happening at that prison, not just the music, but that, that this prison existed. And I'm wondering if the, the way in which popular culture has viewed this site, uh, how you think about that as you go about your work, how that informs perhaps your decisions or, or what you're trying to say, um, what the rest of the world thinks they think about this place. You know, growing up in Louisiana, um, when you hear the men, even today they still have some guys singing in the fields and the music which you hear a lot of the blues came from out the hardship of those men working in those fields, you know. I don't know if this 
answers the question, but I know they had a music symposium at Angola a few years ago, and Charles Neville was there, and he was incarcerated at Angola, and he told uh, the stories about that that's where he learned all his licks. That at that time there was a, a there was a black there was a, a Negro uh, music room and a white music room, and he said he spent all his time when he wasn't cooking uh, cutting sugar cane in that room just learning his licks. And he said what was interesting is that over time the musicians started drifting from room to room. The white musicians would come over to black. So you know it it changes with the times there. You know. I, I'm not sure I answered your question. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm alluding to the fact that uh, Keith, you said that you know people um, people don't know the real Angola. You mentioned that, and and Deborah, you've made very deliberate decisions in your work about its presentation and talking about touching the object. And I'm wondering if those decisions were were at all influenced by um, you know preconceptions you think viewers might have about this place or about these people. One of my one of the greatest things, when I started documenting Angola in the 80s, there was a French photographer named Bernard Herman, and he had pretty much, was one of the better photographers I ever met, but he had permission to pretty much go anywhere he wanted in the state of Louisiana. So when we went to Angola, um, a lot of the music, guys who were, uh, who mass, as black Indians in New Orleans were incarcerated at Angola. So a lot of the culture, even the second line bands, I mean, groups we documented, uh, social and pleasure clubs in Angola. So a lot of the culture, even though they're incarcerated, they continue to bear the culture there, you know? You know so, and then I was blessed to meet a guy named Norris Henderson and Wilbur Rito, who worked for the Angolite at that time, and they was very instrumental in telling me where to go. They said, man, you need to go to CCR lockdown. Uh, if you can get in the over there, go to some of the places that the prison, they're they not gonna hardly show you the whole, like the pictures I show you in the dungeon they call, that's not part of Angola to me. It took us a while to get in those places. And then knowing people, you know, one of the main thing is there's a lot of guys uh, incarcerated in Angola, but there's a lot of guys who are doing a lot of great things. Devil worked with uh, Gary Tyler, who did the play for Passion. So, you know, it's a lot of activity that, that we don't see. You know, it's, it's a lot of things that are bad, but at the same time, you have a lot of guys that are doing a lot of great things there in Angola with the culture. Well, maybe I could would say one little more thing about the, I think the, the image of Angola and pop culture is where we started the question off with, and how is, it, how is that accurate or not accurate or whatever. I, I think that the, the prison is still referred to as the bloodiest prison in the United States. I, that's not true, really. I mean, I think, I mean, it's, it's not, I'm not trying to downplay that it's a violent place, but I, I would say that what I was struck by, because I came into the prison with that expectation, violence, violence, violence. What I was struck by, and I spent, for the first time, I spent a week there um, talking to people with, with complete liberty. Um, I was struck by something else, which was that the fact that everybody there is serving these incredibly long sentences. Strange uh, life situation where I'm not gonna get out of here. Um, and I think that's something that pop culture hasn't really touched. I, I don't think it has. Um, I think there's more, I think we have, I think incarceration impacts people in ways that are much less obvious than violence. I don't mean to downplay violence, I just mean that there's a spiritual dimension to putting someone, taking away their freedom like that, that is, that, that needs to be explored more, I think. I hope so. Um, I was also thinking, uh, wondering about, each of you have spoken, named people in your images, or you've talked about uh, sharing your work with your with the, your participants. What have been some of the reactions to your, your work or your pictures that you've shown them or you know, exactly your writing? Um, have you received any responses to uh, your work? Sure. Um, the people who we work with who have seen the work that we do, they like what we're doing. They give us feedback um, on the images. You know, um, I have so many notes that I've taken and quotes from inmates that are 
It's, it's unbelievable. They have a certain amount of humility that I think a lot of us may not have. Um, talking to people who I've known that's done 30 years and have been exonerated um, through DNA, it's unbelievable their spirit when they come out. You know, I, I'm, I'm one that says that I don't, I don't think I could do that. You know, I don't know what I would do if I were in that situation, but they always say, Chandra, you would do the time and you would get through it because when you have a, a goal to come home and you, you know you're not supposed to be there, some people probably give up, but I'm speaking of one person in particular, Henry James, who um, has, who has um, opened my eyes so much to things that I was bitter about that I didn't even have to do the time for, but um, he faces it every day and he's, he, he's on his goals. He, he had, when he went to jail, he went to jail at 17. Um, he was kind of like displaced, family members, no one knew where he was. He, he, his mother um, died while he was there and he had no one. So when he was in there, he was in there all that time, but he knew that he needed to get out of there because he said he wasn't supposed to be there. So he went through a lot, but he never gave up. He said he'd be walking around the yard, you know, um, in a circle, because it just walking and talking to himself and just saying, why am I here? Lord, I am not supposed to be here. I have to get out of here. And a lot of men thought he was crazy. They were like, oh, Henry James. Man, be quiet. You're at home with us. You know you ain't going nowhere. You're supposed to be here. But, but um, he kept that. He kept that spirit. He knew that he was innocent, and he worked with people and got in touch with the Innocence Project to investigate his case. And he's out. He's free. He's a free man. He's a productive citizen, and he's um, he's his own boss. He builds and makes furniture, and so. Um, I'm really proud to be his friend and to have worked with him and, and continue, you know. I think he's given me a lot of inspiration and insight on the pictures that I've taken. Um, I know when I was giving images back to, to inmates uh, working on my big self, uh, I, I was, it was really surprising. I remember um, one day this guy looked at the, Im the images in his envelope, he was an older fellow, and he walked off and scratching his head and he said, damn, I done got old. <laughs> and so I asked the guard about it and um, C.D. Wright was with me, we both did, and he said, the guard said, well, you know, they come in here when they're 20, 21, and uh, now they're 50 or 60, and they, every day they look in these stainless steel mirrors uh, and you can't tell what you look like. So these men don't know what they look like, which was uh, shocking to me. Um, I know that uh, one day I was walking down the walk at Angola and this guy said, uh, kind of yelled at me from across the yard and he said, uh, you've been to St. Gabriel, haven't you? The women's prison. And I said, uh, how would you know that? I said, I've only been there one time and you are in in Angola, and he said, because I sent my girlfriend that picture you took of me, and she sent me one back just like it. <laughs> so, so I wish I knew more about the stories that these little images uh, produce. Uh, you know, I started this project as a documentary project about the prison population around the turn of the millennium, but by the end of it, it was every bit as much about the power of the personal photograph, the keepsake, and what it means in people's lives. So. Interesting. Uh, 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 this project kind of evolved for you, uh, Deborah, yeah, Keith and Chandra. Perhaps you could share how your project has evolved over the years as well. I mean, you've been doing this now for, over, for a couple decades. So how has this project changed from um, when you first, I know Keith, you first started and then you, um, um, I, I think 
that it's evolved in a way that now, I mean, doing this, as long as we were doing it, now people are becoming more aware. It's becoming a conversation just like us up here. And I would think that probably 10 years ago, 15, no one was having this conversation. No one um, um, was as concerned because you all, us, the public, didn't know, you know, what was going on in there. But images are very powerful. And I always say, the picture does not lie. So what you see is really what it is. You might want to think it's something else, but what you see is what it is. I think uh, it has broadened our perspective because now we're working with guys showing life after incarceration, working with um, people like Norris Henderson, um, Henry James, like Henry now, he's teaching kids woodwork, how they can take a piece of old cypress board, sand it, and make a bench, you know, and uh, getting involved more because Louisiana, to me, um, it's a big plantation, like all the, like in the small parishes, all the private owned jails, they depend on what New Orleans sent to them right now, you know, so we sort of like, um, the main place to get the inmates, so all through Northeast Louisiana, the private owned prisons, if they have 500 beds, they want to keep them beds filled because now that whole town depends on that inmate population, you see. And it's sort of now worse so because you don't get visits like in Angola. In Angola, you can visit your family face to face, but in the new prisons, the private home, you got to be on the screen now so you don't have contact. And I think that's really important. When, when you lose contact with your family member, when you don't have no more interaction with people every day, then it gets worse for the inmate because you then lost contact. And, and some of these small towns, you know, you're not gonna get a family five hours away now, you know. Like, at one time, they had buses that left the night ward all through the city would pick up uh, families to go to the prison, but now I don't see that. Like, in the early days, we would follow families getting on the bus, and again, Prison is hard, not just for the inmate. It's more harder for a mother that's raising, you know, I, I know mother's got two, three sons in Angola. So when she go there, she go to one camp, then she leave that, gotta go see the other guy. So I understand the place of the guys in the prison, but the families that's suffering, the children, the, the mothers and fathers who are trying to get money, because I think it's like 50 or 75 dollars to get a bus ride to Angola. So, I just wanted to add to the the incarceration rate in Louisiana and the 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 private owned prisons throughout Louisiana. Like he was saying, they have no resources like the crops or whatever. That's all gone. So their new thing is filling the prison beds and the prison is what fuels that little town. That that's how the people get work. Um, it depends on how many people are incarcerated. And it's, it's really bad because the, the different sheriffs around the small parishes in Louisiana come to New Orleans and they bid like a slave auction on inmates. It's, it's really bad. I think that we can open it up for some questions. If anyone has any questions, we'll come around with a microphone. Thank you all so much for your presentations. I visited Angola um, in November and I was struck by all of the homes where the prison staff and administration live. Yeah. And I actually talked to some people who, um, like an assistant warden who was born there, his father had been a warden, and so it's this intergenerational culture of primarily rural white people who are staffing Angola. And I'm just wondering, can you all talk about that, that your experience of having Have you done any documenting? Well, it's called uh, B-Land you're talking about. And, and it's, it's a part of the prison called B-Land, and meaning that's what they call free folks live up on B-Land. And B-Land is a world in its own. Um, you might have one black prison that was living up on B-Land, but it's pretty much a community in its own. 
And that's what Angola is pretty much as a family. If your daddy worked at the prison, you became working at the prison. So um, it's the same thing with Gary Tyler, who just came home after 41 years. Him and the new warden of Angola, well, the warden was 19 when he started working, and Gary was 16 when he went to Angola. So they grew up pretty much together now. You know, 41 years later, Gary, Gary is free. But imagine, and some guys like in prison, you know, like you take Gary Tyler with his passion. Um, he was able to pull St. Gabriel women from the prison. And this guy, he, he did everything. So it's a lot of guys that are doing things, but what's happening to me is that Louisiana profiting is from, from the inmates right now. In Angola, you don't see no tractors. You're gonna get in that field. You know, you're not gonna see no machinery anywhere, you know. And it's different now. When I first started pho photographing Angola, you had a quarter to make. And if you didn't make your quarter picking that cotton, you was gonna be beat at the end of the day. But now, times have changed a lot. Um, uh, you see more women now working in the prison and uh, people of color, which I don't know if changed too much, but uh, so do you see some changes, you know? Hi, I also had a question for Keith and Chandra. Um, it seems like, well, first of all, I was wondering how you got access back in 1980 when Angola was a much more violent penitentiary. Um, and it almost feels like you probably couldn't get that same access now, which is interesting considering it is a, a little bit less violent. Could you speak on that? All I gotta do is get my helicopter and just fly in. <laughs> but, uh, well, I ain't going to the maximum security prison. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, we just filmed uh, people coming out of Angola. Um, I think because uh, prisons are getting more, because of media now, um, they're kind of cutting down, but in the 80s, you know, we didn't have any problems. Like, I think when I first started, it was Ross Maggio. Um, well, he's a black barn, but they pretty much, you know, we would write and go up there. They didn't have, you know, and then we worked with a lot of the guys in the prison. The life was uh, some of the programs we went to. But, you know, they're not too interested in letting cameras in too much, seem to more. I don't know what's going on, but. Um, I think it's because the public is more aware now. Yeah. What'd you say, Debbie? You get in there? Uh, well, they had, uh, I don't, can't remember how long Girl Kane was the warden, but many years. And um, I think he was, uh, he was innovative in that he listened to the prisoners. The prisoners had ideas for things they wanted to do and uh, like the drama club and you know whatever all these special projects the woodworking and all this and he listened to them and implemented them and i think there was quite a bit of scandal when he stepped down and so the prison now is under considerable scrutiny and uh, so they've just sort of closed the door at least for now hopefully they'll open back up again because the programming that they had for the the inmates and the public for the public to see who the people are that are in prison and for the inmates to, you know, to be free enough to speak to, to free, the free world is a really important, um, really important thing, so. I think Warden Valor just started something too um, recently, maybe a month ago. It's called A Day of Compassion where he, I, I didn't go to it but I, I will try to make one of them, but it's a day of compassion where I guess he has, but I don't think it's just family. It seems like they're um, open to the public for something, you know, engagement with inmates. But I have to go, but I, I got an email about that, so. Yeah, the, the new warden, Bernard, he's bringing a lot of changes in Angola right now. I mean, he seems to be opening up, um, and even the governor of Louisiana have given more pardon than any other governor in Louisiana. So 
it's some changes being made to me, but I don't think that, like, I can get into Angola faster than I can get into parish prison, which is right in my city. They're not letting no you know, ever got to parish prison. You know, That's in the world, right next to the world. Yeah, you know, they have, so it's, it's kind of, you Are know. people flooded, where it flooded? Yeah. I'll just add a historical fact that so Isaac Franklin opened his first prison in Washington, D.C. in 1838. And um, in order to, people were very interested in what was going on there and the, and the way in which slaves at that time were kept. And he would do tours of the, of the facility to pretend as if it, you know, people were kept well and, and things weren't happening. Um, 1717 Duke Street in Alexandria, Virginia, you can go to his first site where he owned slaves and kept them in pens then at that time. The first is, in Louisiana, I have no idea. Are there very different prison systems between the federal and the state, between the state and local? I mean, it sounds like the private prisons are one area. And is there more openness for you documenting the photography, novels, whatever essays in any of these particular areas, federal, state, local? And then also, any of you photographers working with the families, trying to um, open up that part of the imagery to the rest of the public? Well, right now, we engage with families um, because it's, it's hard for families right now, since Katrina, it's hard for families to go see the um, family now because we all been displaced. You know, most of the people who I grew up in the night ward are never coming back. Um, so, you know, we've been scattered about. So a lot of these guys, even if you're able to come home, like you get parole and you don't have an address to go to, you lived in the lower night ward and your address was 1026 uh, Delray. It, it no longer exists now, so you don't have nowhere to go. They're not gonna send you back out in population if your family all displaced, you see. That's like Henry James, he just, he had a sister he never even seen since they was 16 years old, trying to locate him. So, um, I don't think, one of the main things is, to me, I go through Louisiana, back roads, some places where the civil rights have been still, you know, um, on some of these back roads. And these people vision, to me, when they see a black man, they see you in that field. And that's the level, it's, it's on like that. Like, you know, all, 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 all they're interested in is working you. Because the private owned prison, we got guys in cotton pool want to get back to Angola. Because in Angola, you, you, get, you got population, you got the hobby shop, you have a lot more activity going on. But in a private owned prison, you pretty much there to do whatever they want. And, you know, it's, it's more worse than, than, than state prison. Yeah, um, pri private owned, they're on their own. They, they have to answer to no one. So because they're on their own, your life is in their hands and, and they can do whatever they want with you. And when Keith was talking about visitation rights in the private prisons, you, you can't even go there and be on video with your, with your family member. You have to call, and that's how you talk um, with the private prisons. Now, um, at, in New Orleans, in parish prison, you, cannot, you can no longer visit your family members either. Um, it's video chat. So you go in a, another building, and you're video talking, with the person, you know, which is, it's a disconnection. I'll say that there are a lot of photographers who have done work with families and, and uh, prison yeah. photography is a great blog that you can consult to see uh, that kind of work as well. I just think it's important to mention that Louisiana is the prison the, capital of the, of world. the world. Yeah, yeah. It is, that there's more, yeah, it's the prison capital of the world. There's the highest percentage of the population in prison of any state in the U.S., of any place in the world. In the world. Yes. There's a question back here. 
Hi, I have a question for Zachary Lazar. I'm really curious about um, what you felt fiction allowed you to do in terms of thinking about this place that nonfiction might not have. Yeah, that's a, well, that's a great question. That, the book, I didn't read much of it. Uh, it starts out as straight up nonfiction, and then it, it gets weirder from there. Um, I, I think the section that I read from you showed me me trying to just capture what it feels like to be disoriented in a place like that, where, where you just don't have any comprehension of what, what's in front of you. And I wanted that to be in the book because I, you know, I think Deborah just said that quote earlier about going into a place and uh, don't do the homework first, like do the homework afterwards. And I did, I, I did that, um, but I wanted, the, I wanted my confusion to be part of this book. And I wanted myself to be in this book. And then I also wanted to tell the story of someone who was incarcerated in Angola. And I wanted to force my imagination to make that leap. And I wanted to do all those things. And so I, my books, prior books, I've done that back and forth with fiction, nonfiction. So it's not something that's totally new. But um, I really wanted the book to foreground the fact that I'm an outsider in that world. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that I'm an expert. Um, and I could spend the rest of my life gaining expertise, and I would still not be an expert about that world. Um, I have friends in prison now for five years. I know them very well. One of them will still say to me, like, uh, you know, Angola is the, the Las Vegas rule works in Angola. Like, what, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. There's a certain thing about Angola that, that yeah. no one's going to tell you. And I just, I know that most other novelists would just pretend that that's not the case and they would go forward and pretend that they were experts. Um, I just think that's unethical. <laughs> uh, and I wanted also this book, I want the reader to go through all the stuff that I went through. Uh, what is this? Uh, I think I get it. Oh, but actually I didn't get it. And I've gone further down this road of thinking I get it. Oh, but actually no, that's not it either. Um, and I want, you know, part of this book is actually also about just prejudice. And I wanted the reader to engage with that too. Um, inmates, inmates are stigmatized, and there's a racial component to that, of course, in, in Louisiana, but also, I think, in the United States, period. And all that messy stuff, I wanted that to be in the book. So it's a big scramble of fiction and nonfiction. Um, maybe it makes it more difficult to read, but I think that's, that's part of my job. <laughs> Thanks. I, I just want to make an announcement. Um, Keith and I are having an exhibition at the Chris Center for Arts, um, for Visual Arts in Nashville. Um, it's going to open on, on the 22nd of this month, and this is our publication catalog for that exhibition. Um, the book is Louisiana Medley. The show is Slavery, the Prison Industrial Complex, which will be a traveling exhibition. And Susan Edwards is here from the Chris University. I'm um, sorry, from the Chris Center for Visual Arts, um, the director, and she also wrote, wrote um, in the book. And McKay. And McKay does. McKay the best also. Introductions. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Thank you.